So welcome everybody. Uh, the seminar is usually 20 uh, to 30 minutes presentation, during which you please keep your microphone muted, uh, turn off your video. Um, after this, we're gonna have some time for questions and answers. And you can type your questions in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them away. And then after, after that, it's going to be time for catch up, but it's not recorded. Today, I'm really excited to have uh, Claudio Robustelli test from University of uh, Torino in Italy, uh, who will be uh, talking about the evolution of the magnetic signature of MORBs from 7 to 61 million years along the South Atlantic uh, Ridge flank. So, Claudio, please. Uh, take away the screen is yours. So first of all, let me thank the Magnets organizer for inviting me to have this talk. I am Claudio Robustoli Test. I am a, actually a postdoc at the University of Torino in Italy. And today I'm talking about changing magnetic properties in MORBs and how those properties are changing induced by fluid rock interaction uh, along ridge planks. So the main motivation of my project is related to understand the mechanism of interaction between seawater and the basaltic ocean crust. And in particular, trying to quantify uh, the rates and history and timing of low temperature hydrothermalism. My personal project is related to this biggest uh, project uh, trying to understand how the hydrothermalism is affecting the intensity of the magnetic anomalies because we know that there's a change in intensity depending on uh, the age of the any crust but in reality we don't really know how much other uh, factors like primary ENUS characteristic can affect uh, the variation in intensity. So what we know for now is that the interaction between basalt and seawater is inducing changing in magnetic anomaly intensity. Basically, the seawater uh, derived fluid interaction with basalt is progressively substituting the thermal remanence magnetization, inducing an initial decrease in intensity with a subsequent increase after more or less 20 million years. And the process that is invoked to uh, explain this variability as the magnetization, so the progressive oxidation of titanomagnetite to titanomagnemite, but the crust itself is not homogeneous, so we have heterogeneities within the upper oceanic crust. So how does those heterogeneities change the magnetic properties and uh, also how much they influence the intensity of the hydrothermal alteration? For doing that, I'm studying rocks recovered during the South Atlantic transect. That is the first systematic uh, sampling across an indeformed, slow to intermediate spreading ridge segment of the South or Mid-Atlantic ridge. We, we drilled and recovered basalt from six sites. The youngest, the site U5059 here, uh, that have more or less 6.6 .6 million years moving through the oldest, that is on the western side, close to Rio Grande rise, that have more or less 61.2 million here. And what we recover was different basal that preserve both uh, primary texture, but also significant different style of alteration. Uh, if we look, if we start to look at the magnetic properties, and in particularly the intensity of the NRM, we can see that how our data uh, plotted with the uh, previous result from the, the DSDP uh, sites are practically matching. And if we see here in the histograms, the distribution of the intensity, we can clearly see an initial de decrease with a variability of the mean value, but with older age, there's a widespread uh, value for the intensity. So. There's similarities. This is a very nice um, case study to try to understand the variability, but there's still a lot of heterogeneities. Those variability are also reflected by 
the conics bear ratio. We can see in the first youngest side, the side U5059, that the conics bear ratio is significantly high and then decrease with age in the older side. But at the oldest one, this, the one of 61.2 million here, the conics bear ratio is increasing again. So there's a trend that is reflected in the conics bear ratio. But what are the factors that can influence this variability in magnetic intensity? So possibility, of course, is variation in grain side and concentration of magnetic mineral. And here I plot a couple of rock magnetic uh, proxy of both grain size and concentration. And if we look at the proxy of concentration versus age, we can see that for uh, the susceptibility of the anhistoretic remanents, the value are more or less similar. So we have no a significant change in concentration of low coercivity mineral. But the SIRM is progressively decreasing, suggesting a possible increasing concentration of high coercivity mineral. If you look at the grain size of the low coercivity mineral here, we can see a trend similar to the one uh, presented by the NRM with an initial decrement in the mean value and then progressive increase. But those variability are not really strong. And if you look at the coercivity of remanence, there's just a slightly decrease in the first more or less 15 million years. And then the value are more or less constant. So the average of the different mineralogy is more or less uh, um, flatter. So are those small variabilities enough for explaining this trend in intensity of the magnetic anomalies, or we have to consider other possible process that can affect it. So we can start having a look at how the properties change depending on the placement style, because in the fresh material, uh, the basal that we recovered are mostly sparsely to moderately theory Barbs with different phenocryst of plagioclase and olivine. But the most interesting things is that we observe completely different style of emplacement from very long sequence of pillow lava and short sequence of sheet flow and also massive flow. And if you look at this plot that is basically showing you the intensity of the remanence magnetization uh, coupled with the intensity of the magnetic susceptibility in the different side from the youngest close to the ridge flank here on the right to the oldest close to the Rio Grande rise on the left. We can observe that there are several spikes in both NRM and magnetic susceptibility that are basically reflecting the differences in emplacement style. In fact, if we look at a box plot, we can clearly see that the NRM is on average lower as intensity in the pillow lava and significantly higher in the massive flow. While the susceptibility have, have also a more uh, visible spike in, mag in magnetic susceptibility. So there's a significant difference in magnetic properties depending on the emplacement. And if we look in details here, we can clearly see that on the ARM versus susceptibility, we can observe that the grain size is changing depending on the emplacement style with pillow lava and sheet flow having similar grain size that is significantly finer than the massive flow, which is mostly apparently coarsening. And this variability is also reflected by the coercivity of remanence, while the SIRM is also showing difference in concentration of magnetic mineral cell. The bulk magnetic properties is showing a strong uh, variation depending on the emplacement style. So it's an evidence that the magnetic properties of the crust is not homogeneous and it's not strongly depend only on the age, but also of other heterogeneity. And this variability is also reflect in the conics bear ratio, because we can clearly see that for the massive flow that are the orange dots here, the conics bear ratio is on average significantly lower. So there's 
the in-placement style is affecting the intensity of the magnetic anomalies or not. So what is the other factor that can affect? For example, the alteration. So as I mentioned already, we sample both fresh and halter basalt. And we have a strong variety of alteration from just moderate the ground alteration with slightly substitution of the primary texture or absent to complete replacement of texture and mineral with the more advanced alteration. So if we look at the precious material that have maximum a gray background alteration, the primary feature are preserved. There's no degradation of the texture and there's very slight replacement of the phenoplast. With increasing alteration, there's another type of background alteration that is the orange speckled background in which there's basically an additional substitution of the olivine phenocrit by clay mineral and iron oxide hydroxide. And this uh, substitution and this variability in the background alteration is reflected by the conic spur ratio with on average lower value for the orange speckled background. So also the alteration in the most fresh material is affected. If you look at the most intense alteration, we can observe here three different type of uh, alteration halo, the less altered at the top to the more uh, intense alteration at the bottom. And we have a progressive substitution of the primary in use texture, which is partially preserved in the dark gray halo, the less intense alteration, to completely lost in the orange halo when the alteration is really intense. For the rest, we have a progressive substitution of the phenocris by clay mineral and iron oxide hydroxide with changing color of the clay mineral, potentially to the different formation of other iron oxide hydroxide or the amount of iron oxide oxide inside. And if we look at the conics by ratio, this is not strongly changing for the first two type of halo, for the halo in general, but there's only a slight increase in intensity for the brown halo. So starting to look at the magnetic properties, if we look at a, at a, squareness, plus, a squareness plot, we can see that uh, the freshest material is drawing basically a line with a more or less steep slope, suggesting that there's in fresh material uh, similar content in titanium uh, that is moving mostly close to um, high content in titanium. While with alteration, the squareness uh, parameter is very constant independently on the different emplacement style. It's just similar for the alteration and is moving toward uh, the value typical of pure magnetite with a possible increase in coercivity. So this is suggesting that with alteration, we can have also uh, progressive oxidization of titanomagnetite into titanomagnetite with similar value independent on the alteration. So what is changing with increasing alteration? If you look at the other parameter, for example, for the grain sites, we can see that for the gray background, there's a very wide distribution of grain sites, but typically there's a lot of low value um, of, for example, multi-domain, similar to those of multi-domain magnetite, while with alteration, the value tend to be higher, suggesting a reduction in grain sites of the magnetite or the magnetic mineral in general. If you look at the coercivity of remanence, there's wider distribution of value in the freshest material while moving toward uh, at the bottom to the most intense alteration, there's progressive uh, reduction of the BCR value, and then it's increased again with the orange halo, suggesting a different uh, assemblage of low and high coercivity minerals. And this variability is also reflected by the S higher M, 
in which we can clearly see that in the most intense alterations, the brown halo and the orange halo, those values are significantly low in respect to the mean uh, value of the gray background. So suggesting a progressive increase in uh, high cursivity mineral. So let's start to have a look at the detail if, of the mineralogy. If we look at here in this slide, you can see uh, at the top massive flow and the pillow lava at the bottom with on the left, there's the gray background, so the freshest material on the right that there's uh, the most altered or sample with alteration. So what we can see for the massive flow, uh, for example, is that we have work typical of a mixture of multi-domain and PSD uh, magnetite grains, while in the freshest pillow, the behavior is completely different and is typical of SD magnetite grain. So also in the fresh material, depending on the emplacement state, there's significant difference in grain size. So let's see what happened with alteration. In the massive flow, there's a typical behavior of SD magnetite or finer grain uh, minerals. And similar behavior is also observable in the halter pillow with a slight increase in coercivity there that can be attributed to the progressive intensity, uh, the different intensity of magnetization or the production of small grain uh, hematite, for example. If you look at the thermomagnetic susceptibility curves, we can clearly see that in the massive flow, we have a behavior typical of TM60, while in the pillow lava, we already observe curves typical of titanomagnet. With alteration, the behavior is exactly the same with, we can observe in both cases that we have a curves typical of the presence of titanomagnet. So, there's a significant difference also in the fresh material here, even in terms of uh, type of magnetic mirror. So we can see more in detail low temperature experiment here in which all the curves show uh, a very smooth behavior with a suppressed fairway transition. In most cases, there's a divergent behavior around 50 Kelvin, where it's more significant in the massive flow, supporting the possible presence, the presence of uh, multi-domain titano magnetite. While in the pillow, this behavior can already be uh, associated with uh, the presence of titano magnetite. The same behavior is observed for the halter material in the massive flow, while well, there's a completely different behavior in the orange halo of the pillow, in which we can see a strong divergence between the zero field cool and field cool core that is typical of Goethe. So this is supporting that with strong alteration, there's formation of iron oxide hydroxide. And he, here we can clearly see which kind of mineral are forming like Goethe. Other information that we can observe from the low temperature susceptibility is again, the presence of multi-domain titanomagnetite in the massive flow with variation in field and frequency around 300 Kelvin and also frequency dependence and variation close to the fairway transition. But if you look at the fresh pillow and the halter material, there's no significant variation in frequency and field, or at least they are suppressed by the paramagnetic behavior that is clearly visible here, suggesting that there's strong variation in the alteration intensity and kind in depending on uh, the type of emplacement. So if we have a massive flow or a pillow. For looking in more detail at the out of phase susceptibility with temperature, with at low temperature, we can 
for support the fact that there's a tunnel magnetite multi-domain here with again a frequency uh, dependence at close to the fairway transition at around 300 uh, Kelvin and no variation uh, around 100 Kelvin in the field dependence, the gray and dark uh, foods. So supporting the occurrence of titanium rich, titanium magnetite and multi-domain. But if we observe with alteration here, we can still see some frequency dependence, but at low temperature, but a flat, more or less flat behavior and constant value uh, increasing the temperature that is typical of uh, magnetite with less content titanium close to pure magnetite. So an additional variation rather than just uh, oxidation of magnetite changing in grain size is also changing in titanium content in the magnetic mineral that are forming. So trying to summarize all of those results, what we observe across the South Atlantic transect is that the crust is strongly heterogeneous and the magnetic properties of, are following those variability. In fact, yes, the magnetization process is really important and is strong, but there's also other factors that can affect. In fact, we observe that in fresh material, there's already change in grain size between massive flow and pillow lava, and there's changes in grain size with alteration, but also change in titanium content and the uh, mineralogical assemblages with an increasing concentration of high crucific mineral like and as we can see here, there's change in the NRM intensity depending on those two factors. In fact, with the emplacement style, we can see that there's a more wide variation in value in the massive flow with typical more intense mean. With while in the pillow lava, there's less intense value, and with alteration. We also have switch in the mean value toward lower intensity for the more halter material. So as a conclusion, it's really important to try to compare the magnetic properties and with geochemistry data and also physical properties to try to understand how the alteration is also driven by the different primary factors like the emplacement style, because as we saw here, those uh, the variation in emplacement style is significantly controlling and driving the different alteration within uh, the sample. So it's not just the age that is important, but how much a rocks can be uh, can interact with the fluids, and then alter. So thank you very much for your attention. I would like to acknowledge that this project is founded by the Moore for Record IUDP Italy and that several of those measurements was made at the IRM Institute during a fellowship that they did last year. And I also would like to thank all of my collaboration co collaborator for the IUDP expedition that I did. And thank you. So thanks a lot, Claudio. Big round of applause. Uh, very interesting presentation. Mm, so now it's time for questions. So if anybody from the audience has some questions, uh, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat and I can read it out. Andre. Hey. Hey. Hi, Andre. Uh, hey, Anid. Uh, hi, Claudio. Thank you for that uh, great talk. Uh, well, uh, it's not, uh, it's rather not a question, but uh, well, I'm just curious. Uh, uh, why do you, uh, why do you refer to Verve, uh, to, uh, to Verve transition? Uh, speaking of your low temperature data, I, I could not see any any of the any to be frank uh, to me it's all titanium magnetite or titanium hemite but no magnetite at all 
Yes, I, I totally agree. Maybe I didn't explain me properly. Yeah, right. I, I was just the, pointing yeah. out and the, at the low, are you talking about the the low temperatures as high RAM curves or the susceptibility curves? Because when I was talking about that, I was just referring at the frequency variation that is yeah. typical of titanium magnetite that is happening yes. below the fairway transition, but there's no transition there. Yeah, it's more like there's uh, this, yeah, yeah. You mean uh, you mean just the temperature range, uh, but yeah. this is uh, this is uh, obviously titanium magnetite and nothing Absolutely. else. And yeah, and I totally agree. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, uh, the, those high temperature curves are are all uh, there. Uh, you produce something here if you measure well, yeah, if you course. measure the. If you measure this one uh, after after heat uh, after heating, maybe you will see very way, but uh, it's all produced uh, during heating, obviously. Yeah, but uh, thank you again. It's a very, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, and, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, why other people prepare the questions? We have one. Um, so do you know anything about the time scales and when exactly this alteration is happening? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is still a work in progress. And my postdoc exactly is it, it will work on that. Like my collaborators are working on dating the alteration minerals. So we will have soon some temporal constraint. But the initial alteration, it's the strongest um, type of alteration is visible from 15 million year on in our case, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening before. It's more like related to the different porosity of the material as we can see here, for example, the recovery in the first site is not significant. I mean, it's around 40 meter. And uh, what we recover is mostly shift flows that are less porous, uh, are more porous than pillows. And so probably, I mean, the interplay between the different placement style and the alteration and dating the alteration mineral is the key for understand when the long-term variability happens. But for now, we have no uh, real answer for that science. The age is based basically on the magnetic anomaly. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Next question is from Anna. Hi, Claudio, very nice talk. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about those thermomagnetic curves and it might be playing a role also in your low temperature measurements. You're showing that you're forming clays and iron hydroxides. And I think some of those, yeah, the ones going, I go back to maybe the thermomagnetic because it's clearer in those curves and the thermomagnetic curves, but you see you're producing a mineral between 100 and 300, and certainly maghemite will be playing a role in that temperature range, but also your iron hydroxides. They'll be breaking down and you'll be forming magnetite. And some of the low temperature behavior too might be due, maybe the next one, next low temperature one. Um, no? Well, certainly when you look at these really fast drop-offs, some of those could also maybe be doing due to the iron hydroxides. And uh, I think the next one where you show the out of phase susceptibility, right? That little bump down there at 50 to 70, you know, to 100 degrees, some of that may be coming in. It could be like, again, it could be titanium, but it could also be coming in from iron hydroxide. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're, when you're looking at these results. And then I have another, just a question, a naive question. Um, is there any X solution going on in these titanomagnetites? All right. Thank you very much for comment and suggestion. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we know that the mineralogy is really complex. And of course, in the thermomagnetic curves, we have the formation of 
magnetite. We also run stepwise thermomagnetic curves to see when the alteration is happening, but it's not presented here and it's not ready yet for discussion. But we have, um, coming back to your question, uh, we have no uh, SEM data on the sample yet. We are planning to do that in the next couple of months this year, for sure, to figure it out if there's a solution and this is if this is affecting the magnetic anomaly and eventually doing some magnetic microscopy scanning to confirm where's the magnetic mineral and how they are uh, affecting the intensity of the remnants. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from, from the audience? I mean, this is, uh, these are all very good questions. Maybe your project will help to answer at least part of them. Kind of open question important for several fields as well, not limited to polymagnetism. So, so any, uh, are there any other questions? I guess there are no other questions. So thanks again, uh, Claudio. Another big uh, round of applause. Thank you for giving this very interesting talk. Thank you. If you could please unshare. Yeah, thank you. So just uh, some uh, final communication. Uh, we have uh, speakers already until the 5th of June. Uh, we have some slots for June and August. And all for this uh, talk and the previous ones are available on YouTube. So please uh, join us there. and. Uh, Thanks again and see you next time.